The first uh, first talk is entitled Benefits of CT and How Leading Academic Institutions Are Communicating Risk to Patients. This is one of the things that I think we all struggle with, and I asked Dr. Brink to sort of ask his buddies how everybody is really dealing with this. So he's going to share that experience with us. Great. Thanks, Diane. Good morning. Let's see and make this work. So unquestionably, the benefits of CT qualitatively are, are well known to all of us in the room. You know, it's, it has extremely uh, high uh, resolution, which allows just superb anatomic depiction of just about every organ or uh, physiologic territory from the head to the toe. And it allows us to both uh, confirm or exclude innumerable diagnoses on a minute-by-minute -minute basis worldwide. And just for the next few minutes, I'm just going to highlight some of the where we've just gone with CT from um, the basics to the more advanced. And so for decades, we relied on the ability for computed tomography to make sort of bread loaf-like loaf slices of the body in two dimensions. And we would use those, uh, that information to help us extrapolate to our three-dimensional understanding of anatomy to make important diagnoses such as not just this tumor of the liver, a hepatoma, but also to recognize its invasion of the ligament, of the gastropatic ligament that links it to the stomach, uh, which is the uh, bright uh, structure over there with the, the contrast in it. And so we could um, make good use of it. Is there a pointer on here? Is it this? Oh, I see. Got it. Thank you very much. Um, we also, of course, could use these two-dimensional images to replace, to use CT to actually replace conventional studies that we had done for decades, such as the intravenous pilogram. By um, doing two-dimensional imaging of the pelvis, we could recognize a stone uh, impacted at the ureterovesical junction, and even to recognize the uh, edema within the wall of the bladder, the trigone of the bladder. And so it wasn't long before when we got to multi-slice imaging that we could actually reformat images in multiple planes and make a, take advantage of the true volumetric nature of the acquisition to see a uh, bird's beak sign that highlights the presence of a sigmoid volvulus in this very dilated piece of colon here. And then even taking that volumetric acquisition and combining it with advances made through the gaming industry, um, Pixar and other uh, companies such as uh, that, uh, we opened up a whole new uh, category <coughs> excuse me, of applications ranging from virtual colonoscopy to CT and geography of almost every organ or vascular territory, including the coronary arteries. Virtual colonoscopy or CT colonography produces images of colonic polyps such as this, which rival the appearance of those seen at direct visualization. And combining with technology uh, pioneered in the gaming industry, we can actually color code mucosa that wasn't seen when we flew through the colon from the opposite direction, something the real colonoscope cannot do. And CT and geography of um, uh, patients such as this having suffered a motorcycle accident with a comminuted fracture of the tibia and fibula, we can recognize the vascular disruption crossing the comminuted fracture uh, with reconstitution of the anterior tibial artery below the fracture plane. And for the coronary arteries, it would really prove to make a great advancement to replacing potentially the uh, catheter-based angiograms that we had been uh, known to uh, re re rely on for so many decades. Leveraging the high negative predictive value of CT, we can exclude coronary artery disease, even when patients with indwelling stents in the coronary arteries, as the cause of chest pain when, in fact, we don't see disruption of flow in these vessels. And when we do have disruption of flow, we can actually recognize the, both the soft and hard plaque that uh, is present, the soft plaque being the gray stuff here and the hard plaque being the bright calcified plaque, and uh, color code it uh, with some help from uh, human operators, but to really show us the extent of coronary artery disease. And when we combine it with um, uh, more broad-based imaging of the thorax, we can exclude potentially all three causes of life-threatening causes of chest pain, coronary artery disease, potentially aortic dissection, which would be here in the aorta, as well as pulmonary emboli in the pulmonary arteries. Aortic dissections are very easily recognized, uh, as in the case of this type B dissection extending from the uh, distal aspect of the aortic arch and extending down the descending aorta, both on 2D reformats and three-dimensional renderings. And pulmonary emboli, easily seen as filling defects within the uh, pulmonary arteries. So just a quick uh, tour de force, if you will, of um, many different uh, applications that have come about, uh, highlighting, I think, just qualitatively the exploding benefit of CT. 
But of course, with that, uh, with those possibilities and the increasing number of indications, the increasing instances in which CT has been used to replace a plain radiographic examination, the speed and ease of use have all contributed to a very, uh, if not uh, exponentially rising uh, exposure, radiation exposure to our population because of it. And so quantitatively, it's been a bit more difficult to really get our hands around what are the quantitative benefits of CT. And um, I highlight one uh, article that just appeared um, just last month from uh, my new institution at uh, Massachusetts General Hospital, in which uh, colleagues there uh, reviewed 22, about 22,000 patients' records uh, in an uh, 18 to 35-year-old range and found that they were more, much more likely to die from the conditions prompting the scan than they were to be esti- than they might be from uh, the potential risks from the radiation. And so this study actually appeared in um, uh, radiology, and it was entitled Body CT Scanning in Young Adults Examining Indications, Patient Outcomes, and Risk of Radiation-Induced Cancer. And the important points to recognize are that, um, well, first, that they, again, they looked at patients in this relatively young age range uh, for over a four- or five-year period. They followed the mortality uh, over a 5.5-year uh, range, and then they estimated radiation risk from BR7 um, projections. And they noted that um, if you look at, for example, patients who are undergoing chest CTs, the number of those who died over that period of time were um, uh, 7%, whereas those that would have been expected to die because of the radiation that were administered was 0.1%. And for abdominal CT, it was 3.9% who actually died versus 0.1% who would be projected to potentially die of their radiation. And then they, par- they parsed out those without a cancer diagnosis just to focus on benign disease. And even still, they found that um, among chest CT patients, 36 uh, um, uh, died of their uh, conditions as compared to 0% would be expected or, very, I guess, rounding down to 0. And 1.9 from abdominal pelvic CTs as compared to 0.1. So these investigators at least felt that when they're talking to patients, in a gro- relatively global sense at least, that most of the time when we're scanning patients, there's a condition that really warrants um, the a scan to help guide the di- the, the, both the diagnosis and the treatment of individuals and that their relative risks, um, their relative benefits far outweigh their risks. However, the, probably the biggest cause for, for alarm really comes when we have unnecessary CT scans because there's no question that scans that aren't necessary are thus not beneficial and thus risks will always outweigh benefits if benefit is zero. And uh, of course, this has been our bane for quite some time, highlighting, uh, highlighted Unfortunately, back in the lay press, we don't like this one. It's on the front page of our national newspaper in which uh, these investigators said that about one-third of all CT scans uh, that are done right now are medically unnecessary. And that's a number that's been bantered, bantered around for some time as to about the percentage of, of scans that potentially uh, have no benefit because they're just not appropriate or, or are unnecessary. Happily, there are some tools that we have, and probably the, the most robust tool out there, and it's being adopted actually worldwide now, is the uh, ACR appropriateness criteria. If you're not familiar with this, the ACR appropriateness criteria is basically a big database of topics, medical topics, such as in this case hematemesis, variants, uh, such as no history of alcoholism or liver disease, and then all the possible tests that one might consider, and then a numeric score ranking the relative appropriateness of those tests on a one to nine scale. There are, uh, when I surveyed this database um, back uh, in 2010, there were about 7,500 combinations of topics, variants, and tests. I'm sure it's increased since that time. But it suffice it to say that CT is a possibility in about 12% of all the combinations. So that's a, just keep that number in mind for a moment. It's a possibility in nine, about 900 out of the 7,500 uh, combinations. The way it works on the, if you go to the website, this is the web interface and what it looks like, and um, you can see for that same condition, hematemesis, which is, which is vomiting blood if you're not familiar, and uh, no history of alcoholism or liver disease, you'll see that CT is actually rated as a four, so not terribly appropriate, with other tests being more appropriate. In addition, there's a relative radiation scale, which gives the, uh, the uh, individual examining this database a, a relative sense of the radiation this is somewhat controversial because these numbers change, and it's, it's hard to put your hat, hang your hat and say this is definitely the dose you're going to be getting, but just to be aware that that's part of the, the plan. 
Let's look at a different scenario. Blunt abdominal trauma, unstable patient. Uh, CT is not the best test because, as anyone who works in the emergency room knows, we do fast ultrasound imaging in the trauma bay for that and plain radiographs before assessing whether patients need to go to the operating room because they're unstable. But if they're stable, of course, then CT is the number one test at a score of nine. Uh, This is stable with hematuria. And in fact, uh, even if they're stable uh, with no hematuria, then it's still the best test. So again, of interest now, remember that that number I told you before, CT was present uh, as a possibility in 12% of all combinations in this database. Well, it's actually the number one test in 12% of those. So it's 12% of 12% is it the number one test. And yet it sure feels like we do a lot more CT than that might suggest. It's actually among the top three uh, possibilities in about a third, about 31%. So what about uh, a little more granular um, and uh, um, look at this? Um, in, I guess a, a reasonable axiom is that in high-risk patients, CT should be avoided when a non-ionizing radiation modality, such as ultrasound or MRI, is of comparable utility. And probably the best example of this, I think, comes, at least in my practice, uh, in pregnant women with right lower quadrant pain. Very few places really do MRI for these, uh, this indication because of the challenges of setting up a 24 by 7 MRI service. But it's a very simple test to do without IV contrast. It takes just um, uh, a few minutes to acquire these situated images in axial and coronal planes. And you can see here the dilated fluid-filled appendix and the appendicolis all lined up within it, confirming the diagnosis of uh, appendicitis. Even confounding diagnoses are readily seen. This is another pregnant woman uh, being imaged with MRI with suspected appendicitis, and in fact, she has a stone in the ureter, a kidney stone that has passed rather than being appendicitis, and that, that too is diagnosed with the pilosinus backflow we see around the kidney. So what does our ACR appropriateness criteria say about this? Well, uh, happily, it uh, is appropriate. I mean, it says that CT... Uh, isn't the most appropriate test in a patient who is pregnant with fever and elevated white count because uh, MRI or M- uh, ultrasound would be more appropriate if diagnostic. And so uh, we're happy that the appropriateness criteria reflect uh, that best practice. Even in asymptomatic patients, this was a nice paper that David Brenner uh, wrote uh, some years ago just looking at CT colonography after the American Cancer Society endorsed CT colonography as a screening test for colorectal cancer, he concluded that in the anticipated lifetime risk of colorectal cancer is in the range of 5 to 6%, and the potential risk of a radiation-induced cancer from the examination in a 50-year-old, which would be the first year of recommended screening for colon cancer, uh, is uh, 14%. And then by age 70, of course, it's down to, to 0.7%. And his conclusion was that benefit greatly exceeds risk, even in this asymptomatic population of people wanting to be screened to, ex- to be sure they do not have uh, this potentially fatal disease. Let's turn now to uh, communicating risk. And uh, in this next uh, part of the uh, talk, I'll be really looking at these points. What, is, what do patients want to know? Should we be giving informed consent? And what are academic centers doing? And what resources might be available? So the first question is, what do patients want to know? I'm going to talk briefly uh, about a pilot study that um, we were just just concluding uh, before I left Yale. It's a combination between Cincinnati Children's and Yale with Andrew Trout and Marilyn Gosky, for, also from Image Gently uh, from Cincinnati, and then Jay Pahati and myself, um, Jay at Yale. I was formerly at Yale and also sort of representing Image Wisely. And our goal was to really do a pilot survey of patient advocacy groups to understand what they want to know. And we titled this Power to the People, a patient a pilot survey of advocacy groups, uh, what they want to know before they have their radiologic examinations. And we, we culled questions kind of from the Image Gently, Image Wisely campaigns that we suggest people ask to see how that really resonates with them. And unfortunately, these, this was going to be presented at the ABR's Foundation's summit last week, but none of us, none of the four of us got there, so it didn't get presented. So you're seeing it for the first time, and I've asked Jay and Andrew for their permission since uh, I'm kind of stealing their thunder. They're the junior faculty who did this. Uh, Here is the uh, questions that we were uh, considering. What is the name of the test you'd like to do? What test involves, does the test involve radiation? How will the test improve my or my child's care? Other alternatives? Um, Will we have the uh, kid-sized dose for children? Is the doctor reading the exam certified? Is the facility accredited? These are the questions we asked our patients to react to. And it's interesting, the, um, what the respondents really wanted to know was the logistical information, like how do I prepare for the exam, how do I get there, where do I park, 
will there be discomfort or pain? There was mild interest, really, about the radiation. And within that, they were most interested in knowing whether the center was using low dose and less interested in the dose itself. They wanted to know how the results will be used and how soon they'll get the results, um, which I think all kind of fits with what we would might imagine the, that these answers to be from what we know of the lay public. Kind of like when you go flying an airplane. You're not so uh, concerned. You, you want to believe that your pilot isn't drunk and your pilot certified. You don't really care to see the certificate necessarily. And that was another point that was here, that they really were not concerned so much about seeing the certification or being sure. They, they just want to trust that the facility is certified. The other thing I thought was interesting was that as scientists and, and physicians were so um, obsessed with being so precise, we're trained to be precise, right? So it's hard for me to talk about this topic and not use the word ionizing because I want to clarify we're talking about ionizing radiation, not other kinds of radiation. But the public doesn't know what we're talking about. And it's prompted me to drop the word ionizing because it just confuses them. Sounds like iodine maybe, and I don't know. They want to, uh, an inter- interesting point. Um, I think the, the uh, upshot is that the radiation exposure and risk appears to be viewed as less important by patients and parents, and thus it is incumbent upon us as practitioners to educate them about the importance of radiation and to provide them with useful resources and information. Um, they said that they would be reassured if they knew the center was using low-dose techniques without getting into the weeds about exactly what, what, that, what those doses are. And so I think that's an important point. Our goal is to extend that to a much broader survey. We're seeking funding for that now. But surprisingly, there's very little else out there that actually captures the patient's experience on the front end to know what it is that they really want to get out of that test and what do they want to be told before they start. So I hope that was helpful. Informed consent is the next piece of this. And I'm not going to get into the weeds on this one because this is a very controversial thing. Suffice it to say, I'll refer you to two articles, a point-counterpoint uh, in uh, radiology last year, and you can see where I sit on this side of the fence because uh, Marilyn Gosky, myself, uh, representing Image Gently and Image Wisely, and uh, John Patty, who was chairman of the board of the ACR at the time, wrote the point or counterpoint, depending on your perspective, in which we argued that informed decision-making trumps informed consent for medical imaging with ionizing radiation, meaning it's important to communicate, but we didn't want... Uh, and I still don't believe we want to get into the, into the uh, notion of actually requiring written informed consent, mostly because of all the uncertainties around it, uh, around what we're talking about. I'm, I'm a, a big proponent for being uh, aggressive about radiation, dose reduction, and risk mi- mitigation. But I think that taking it to informed consent, uh, written informed consent, would be a mistake. There is a counterpoint and an equally valid set of arguments made by Richard Simelka and others saying that uh, the time has come for informed consent. So I'll let you decide. I will throw in one other little point, though, and that is that uh, Leonard Berlin, who represents medical legal issues for our specialty, uh, had just published an article one year earlier informing patients about risks and benefits of radiology exams using ionizing radiation, a legal and moral dilemma. i just show you the last paragraph from his article. In summary, here is the dilemma that confronts radiologists. Yes, of course, we have a legal and moral duty to disclose potential complications uh, based on facts to patients and to obtain informed consent on the basis of those facts. But when it comes to conjectures, maybe he overstates it with unproven theories, but regarding the question of whether diagnostic radiation causes cancer, what, if anything, does our legal and moral duty require us to disclose? It is a dilemma that has no solution today and, indeed, may not have a solution in the foreseeable future. So... Uh, I tend to sit on the side of the fence, which doesn't want to go require people to sign legal documents to get their CT scans, uh, but I'll let you decide. So what are academic centers doing to communicate risk? And I've surveyed four or five here, and I'll I'll report those to you. Um, They're kind of all over the place, and so you can also sort of see where, where how you feel about this. I'll show you first, but it's probably the most extreme. And uh, Stephen Birnbaum, at, uh, formerly at Southern New Hampshire Medical Center, I think it's probably the most extreme in the country. And Steve is very unbashful about sharing with audiences such as you why he took this approach. His daughter, as he's very uh, public about sharing, was in a, a serious car accident several years ago, taken to a local area hospital, and was in the ICU for many weeks as she clung to life. They were repeating CT scan after CT scan. And finally, as a father, he stepped in and said, stop, you know, you don't need the incremental benefit of yet another CT scan isn't going to help her. Um, he's a physician. He was watching, trying to have to, to meddle too much, and then finally said, enough's enough. Uh, he went back after she recuperated, thankfully. She uh, got better. 
and decided to, he did decide to uh, uh, implement an informed consent process. Uh, informed consent required on all pediatric patients and adults under age 40 who are getting a body CT exam. His rationale was that CTs with a dose of 10 millisieverts, of course, we know the, the, the oft-quoted statistic of uh, 1 in 2,000 potential fatal cancer risk. And he said, well, you know, gosh, the risk of uh, a death from a contrast reaction is 1 in 250,000, so it's much less than that. Why wouldn't we get informed consent? Well, the fact is most places don't get consent for contrast, so it doesn't necessarily follow. But regardless, the point about contrast is well taken. And another thing that Steve said is we have all these notifications in the medical record, contrast allergy, and yet the risk is only 1 in 250,000. Why ought, We ought to have something in the medical record when we're approaching much even lower risks. So he created a CT radiation alert. This is back before they went filmless, and here is with a, a, a film folder uh, identifying a patient as having had a lot of radiation from CT. I'll t- show you what those criteria are in a minute. But even in the medical record, they have radiation safety alert popping up when a patient has exceeded certain thresholds. And those thresholds in his practice are as follows. He identifies patients to get that alert if they uh, have had five scans under age 40 with benign disease, the idea being that five scans, of course, when he put this together, was probably on the range in a gross sense of about 50 millisieverts. Of course, that that may well have hopefully come down since he put this program in place. Um, And also even the benign is a little controversial. If you go to talk to the folks at Sloan Kettering, they take great umbrage at this because a lot of times cancer is a chronic disease, not necessarily a fatal disease. So to put a... um, a, a qualification to requiring benign disease may be a little weird. Um, but nonetheless, when, when patients do exceed that threshold, he notifies the referring physician and puts a note in the record, as I've shown. The patients who had more than 10 scans, he provides further history in counseling, and that counseling occurs in the form of a letter that gets sent. Here's the letter to patients who have had more than 10 helical CT studies. I'm writing to you as my role as the radiation safety officer. And here's the meat of the matter. He says, it has come to my attention that you've had a large number of CT scans in the course of your evaluation and treatment. Our team will be tracking the number of CT scans. Uh, We will work closely with your physicians and other healthcare providers to identify ways to, other alternative ways to diagnose your problem. Sincerely, Steve Brimbaum. So uh, this is by far and away the most extreme, I think, in the country for aggressiveness when it comes to uh, communicating risks. What about Sloan Kettering? I mentioned them before. Uh, Larry Dower, who I had the pleasure of meeting at the NCRP meeting earlier this week as a a physicist, I don't know, maybe Larry's here, um, uh, wrote this article on the fears, feelings, and facts interacting, interactively communicating benefits and risks. And uh, he reviews just sort of the wide range of possibilities out there. There's the paternalistic approach, I'm your doctor, I know what's best. Quality assurance approach, we have the latest equipment, lowest dose. Risk comparisons approach. How many chest X-ray equivalents is your exam? How many transatlantic flights? And then, of course, the risk numerology gets complicated in milligray, millisieverts, et cetera. And his point was simply as as follows. Just try and keep this message clear. Three key messages. Use numbers and visuals, particularly visuals, like a Richter scale of risk. I'll show you some examples shortly. Dialogue with the patients. Address trade-offs. And make sure that they understand when you conclude your, your discussion with them. Um, Boston Children's, uh, minimizing uh, and communicating radiation risk in pediatric nuclear medicine. Uh, Fred Fahey, Ted Trevis, and uh, uh, Jim Adelstein. Um, Advocate use of a graphic, and I think graphics are very helpful. Here's a graphic from their paper in which they illustrate communicating the risk of 1 in uh, 2,500 excess risk of cancer from radiation in a 10-year-old getting a bone scan as compared to the 550 of patients that age who would die naturally of cancer. So here's 550 dots. Here's the one dot out of a total table of 2,500 dots. So sometimes people can relate better to those graphics than to the numbers and words. Uh, University of Michigan, helping patients decide 10 steps to better risk communication. I found this paper to be very interesting. This is not just about radiation, but just about communicating risk of anything. And um, I show you the summary of their recommendations, which I'll let you peruse on your, at your leisure, but I do want to highlight again one key thing, which is present information in pictographs if you're going to include graphs. And they give a different kind of pictograph where they show um, adding therapies and how it changes risk, of how many people will die, of, uh, be alive, will die of cancer, die of other causes. And you can use sort of bar graphs like these when you're talking about radiation risks. 
And finally, University of California at San Francisco took a different approach. They went out and just built this huge website. Uh, it's a very uh, detailed and elaborate website. What is radiation? How is it used? And how is it measured? Um, very detailed, lots of links. And my only point about this, I think it's great they did this. My only point is that there are other resources available to avoid having to do that. And the Image Gently and Image Wisely websites are, I think, very uh, robust. And I encourage you to at least look at them before setting off and embarking on building your own. Uh, I show you the Image Wisely website here. As of February 18, we had 17,000 pledges to our program. And you'll see that it's organized not just with content for imaging professionals and referring practitioners, but there's a link for patients. And direct your patients there, and you'll find that they um, have direct links to the radiology benefits risk primer at radiologyinfo.org. And there's also some um, movie clips that can explain in very simple language to, about a husband and wife discussing radiation concerns and a mother and child discussing radiation concerns. The Benefits Risk Primer and the RadiologyInfo.org website are really, really nicely done. They are a co-sponsored project of the ACR and the RSNA with a lot of time, attention, and resources devoted to making sure that the content is easily understandable by the lay public, something that's not easy for us to do. And there's also a link to an image, uh, a medical imaging history record card that was done in collaboration with the Food and Drug Administration. So I thank you very much for your attention, and I hope this has been helpful to sort of set the stage for today's uh, rest of the discussion. Thank you.